Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mohrik. I'm a professor of chemistry at School of Molecular Sciences. So, Vladi, we've been at, in molecular sciences at ASU for a while now. And I think having taught some physical chemistry courses together, having done some research together over the years, um, I think you and I both have the feeling that one of the things that often gets missing and that makes uh, physical chemistry more difficult for students is really getting to the fundamental mathematics behind systems. And this isn't just true in physical chemistry, it's really all areas of physics, chemistry, biology that we work in, where the underpinnings of mathematics really plays an important role of how well students can do things. Yeah. And, and I would say it's even, in a way it's even worse than that, because we have all heard several times that many of our students, they consider math to be a hurdle. To be well, they're afraid of it. They're afraid of it. And, and this is something that worries me a lot because the, the truth of the matter is that we cannot teach them physical chemistry without math. I would go even one further, even in general chemistry, when I, uh, or, you know, introduction to bio, introductory biology, chemistry courses, physics, the number of times students will say, I am so interested in X area of science. I, I really love chemistry. I just hate the math. Or I don't yeah. feel like I can do high, you know, high level mathematics and that's kind of what's holding me up in the field. And, you know, I always step back and say, you know, I, I get it that math can sometimes feel very abstract, but it is the cornerstone of all science. You really can't do even the most basic science without mathematics. It underlies it's everything a, we do in it's, science. It's the language. It is and the language even of though science. Mathematics by itself is not a natural science. Natural sciences depend dramatically on mathematics as a language. Everything we do, I mean, so, so looking at it as an obstacle, it's, it's really like uh, liking food and, and, and hating silverware. Right. <laughs> It is true that you can eat with your hands <laughs> and with your mouth if, it, if that comes to it. But uh, you see, I mean, it's, it's, it's so extremely important. And uh, most of the time what I, what I have seen is that our students, they do have the mathematical knowledge in their brains. The problem is that for reasons that, I mean, that, that, that would be too much to talk about that here, but they cannot access this uh, knowledge in a, in a in a reasonable way, so that when they need it in chemistry, it's, it's not there, but it is there. So yes. part of our job is re helping them to reestablish these bridges, these well, connections. I, I think you and I both have the same fundamental feeling, which is the inspiration for this series, which is oftentimes I think learning the math is divorced from doing the science. They learn the mathematics in mathematics courses, and then they you know, and then they learn science and science courses. And really what this is, is a bridge to say a lot of people need that when they're learning the mathematics, that only makes sense. It only, if they can immediately start applying the math right. they're using. And, and, it, the, and this disconnection. Is what's critical. It's, it's, it's what's critical. And this is what we're going to try to, I don't know where to correct it, but uh, to show it. Right. And, and to, to show that if you correct this disconnection, it, right. it might be a lot of fun. So in this, our uh, mom's series, Mathematics of Molecular Sciences, we're gonna break down different aspects in the molecular sciences, in chemistry and biochemistry, et cetera, where uh, important topics in these fields, ones they see from introductory chemistry all the way through advanced, and you know, break down some of the mathematics needed to be able to do that. Yeah, and just to make sure that we did not mishear the acronym. Moms. Moms. Right? You wouldn't be anywhere Ma without your mom. No, you would not be a, anywhere without the mom. The mathematics and you of yeah, molecular science. You would not science. be anywhere in science without mathematics. Right. We, would, we would be lost. We yeah. wouldn't be able to talk to each other if we didn't have mathematics to formalize the science we do. Um, and so, and then I'll try to, uh, this series initially, I'll have it uh, on our, uh, BioPchem website, and we'll have a YouTube stuff, et cetera. So hopefully this will uh, become a series of, of mom's lectures that we'll have. And today, 
uh, we're going to specifically look at uh, first order kinetics and look at some of the mathematics behind that. Um, so first order chemical rate kinetics is something that is, is a pillar in introductory university level uh, and even high school level uh, chemistry courses, and then comes back again in physical chemistry uh, courses, et cetera. But at the heart of chemistry is doing reactions and knowing whether they're gonna take infinite time or you know, an at a second uh, is pretty important <laughs> uh, to yeah. the whole field of chemistry. Uh, right, and you know, first order kinetics, it corresponds to this simple reaction. A reactant A is transformed to a, into product. A, pro to a product P with a rate constant K. Right. That's what it is. Just meaning, how fast does it happen? Right. right. Like, I mean, right. ultimately, that's what we want to know. We, reactants are going to products, and from a very practical standpoint, we need to know how fast they're going to get there and right. how, you know. And the dimensions of this rate constant are inverse seconds or inverse time, which, I mean, depending on the on the order of the reaction, this might change, but, but for this very simple case, this is just a clock. Right, and that's what we mean by rate. You know, when right. we say rate of something, we're, we're asking for, you know, an inverse time. Right, so then the thing is that when we want to write the, the kinetic equation, we use the language of differential equations. Now, and I, I like to interject here and just say one thing, which is this is when a lot of times when students are taking introductory chemistry or even when they're taking it at kind of an advanced level, like a physical chemistry, a lot of the students haven't had what you would say a classic course in ordinary differential equations or, or just what we call Diffie Q class, right? A lot of students kind of stop at, you know, one or two semesters of calculus but they have seen what a derivative is. Right. So first order differential equation, here we have the most general form of a differential equation. Now, y prime, this is the derivative of y with respect to x. <clears throat> so here we have the derivative and then a, a function that is known, right. e of x, and then again, the function y of x, and this is equal to q of x, which is another function. This is the most general form of a first order differential, ordinary differential equation, because we might have a differential equation that are partial, but, but let's right. talk about well, ordinary. Well, partials come so important in right. other fields. Right, 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 right. So then when we write this in a very simplified way. Uh, just, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, let me, they're all, as a function of x, so right, you just right, kind right. of uh, you just it. remove that to simplify the notation. You write y prime plus p times y equal to q. Right. Now, when we see this type of differential equations, the unknown in a differential equation is a function. In this particular case, the unknown is y as a function of x. So we see that somehow because the derivative appear, appears here, we we know that there is an inverse relationship between the derivative and the integral. So we know that solving this differential equation, at some point it is going to involve an integration step. Right. Okay? And, and I think it is worth pointing out, like you have here, that, that oftentimes you'll see it written um, you know, like this, or even like, you know, and it, cause it's often notation that'll always mess up students, like you said, and you sometimes see it with a prime, very old school. You don't see this near as often anymore, but some people used to put dots, you know, above things that's usually, you, a lot of people will do that, especially if it's time oriented derivative, uh, et cetera. But, you know, there are lots of different ways of representing, you know, a derivative. Right. Um, and, and, you know, this is something we'll provide links to of, of just some of the underlying nomenclature and stuff behind yeah. standard derivatives. So this is the first connection. What we call here y of x in chemical kinetics is going to be the concentration as a function of time. So time plays the role of x and a, the concentration of the 
React and plays the role of Y. Right. So no reason to be confused. And and no reason, I mean, there is nothing sacred about this nomenclature. You can well, and that's whatever. one of the things that's often hard for students. So they're used to just seeing these just random variables. Y of X does this. P, and, and the nice thing about what we're trying to do here is immediately put it to things that are tangible. These are the reactants. These are the products of things. This is happening as a function of time. That is the variable we want to look at. Right, and then this here is the rate law in a way. So what we have here is that because in this chemical reaction, the way it is written, it happens only in one direction. What, I, what is happening is, is that the reactant is consuming the reaction and the product appears in and the And so reaction. that's why we have to take count of that negative. That's why they're equal in op. I mean, that's why we put the negative. Right. Yeah. That's why we put a negative here because the reactant is this being is consumed, dissipating. disappearing. And we put a plus sign here because the product is appearing. Now, the, the other important thing is that in a first order reaction, the velocity, because this is the velocity of the reaction, or the rate, right. more rather than the velocity. Yeah, classically what they think of as velocity is, you know, in freshman physics is how does it, in the x direction, how does it move as a function of right, time? And right. this is how the concentration is moving right. as a function of time. So, so this the is same. the rate. Yeah. Now, the, the main thing is that the, re, the rate is proportional to the concentration. So the more you have of that, the the rate is increased. And this constant here is the the rate constant. And, and as we see, it has the units of inverse of time because these are concentration units, concentration units. We are we have here missing time, so we need that K has units of inverse time because this dt is here. So dimensionally, this equation is correct, and physically, this equation is correct for a first order kinetics. So now we see that if we write this equation in this form, dA dt plus k of times the concentration equal to zero, we see immediately that it corresponds to what we call here the homogeneous differential sure. equation. Homogeneous means that q is equal to zero. So this is a particular case of a first order differential equation, the homogeneous differential equation. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, just for clarity, I mean, for uh, those watching that might not remember, when we we're saying, when we put things in brackets in chemistry, which we put both A, our reactants, as well as our products, what we're saying is, we're, we're looking at that at, from a molecular standpoint. That's the number of moles over, you know, divided by the volume in liters. So it's it's molarity that we're thinking about it, the concentration of those things. So. Right, and then we see, I mean, if we if now we're here to the left, we see this homogeneous equation. And that's what we want to solve. Right, and we want to solve it. So yeah. here, it's actually easier to look at the solution on the left side and then go back to the right side and identify everything step by step so that you can actually convince yourself that what you are doing in the, in the chemical kinetics problem is exactly to solve a first order homogeneous equation. So we just write it the, again, this y prime equal dy dx. What I like to stop right at this point right here yeah. And always point out, like you said, like I think this is what this is really where students have a problem because if they have taken differential equations or, or calculus and seen some of this, they often see it in this very generic term. And then they never directly apply it, which is what we're we're doing over here. And and I think this is really a good chance for students to really think about this. And then you can see how these things directly apply to real systems where you can plot it, you can do things with it, et cetera. But even when you look right here, even remember from your very introductory, some of the first derivatives you learn. I mean, this is something where you're gonna take the derivative of y with respect, and you're gonna get the function y back, right? I mean, as soon as uh, you know that it, you're gonna take the derivative with respect to something and get the function back, you, you immediately start thinking of things, you know, there's very few functions that come back after a first derivative, exponentials being, Famously, one of them. Right, and then of course, we want to remind you here of the what is called the fundamental theory of 
differential calculus, that if you have the integral of a function of x, dx, and you call this capital F, then the fundamental theory, what it, theorem, what it tells you is that if you take the derivative of capital F, you get back the function, the function under the integral. This is the essential thing. So, and this, this is so important that it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right. And this is exactly what we're going to use here. So we have this differential equation, and now we, okay, we assume that uh, y of x is not zero, so we divide it, we, we move this term to the denominator, and we put this dx here, so now we have this in the very simple form, everything here depends on y, on y and yeah. everything here depend on in other words separating x. variables we are separating we often, variables. yeah and, and this is true and when you can separate variables you can integrate the two sides with respect to each individual to, to each individual so so we have here dy divided by y equal the integral of p dx and then we call it capital p the, the same as here the the integral of of uh, lowercase p so we get immediately the integration as a logarithmic function. And it's nothing else, there's nothing different from this. So now when you look, when you go to the differential equation, then you see here that k is equal to p, if you compare the two things. So this is an extremely simple case because in general, to, to make this integral, you need, you need to know what lowercase p is. But here you know that it's, it's a constant, so you can integrate immediately, and this is why you get this very simple solution. So, so this is completely equivalent to the solution of the differential equation. This gives you the concentration at time t, this gives you the function as a function, the y as a function of x. It's a constant, the constant is the concentration at time zero times the exponential of minus capital P, this is e to the minus kt. So the analogy is complete, right. step by step. And, you know, like we said, the real key here is to be able to look at these kind of first order homogeneous differential equations where they often in, in mathematics text, and we'll give links to some of our favorite places to look this up and videos on this, but that you can immediately start applying it to real systems where you can make very intuitive sense of what's going on in a reaction, et cetera. And let me just let me interrupt you there because you see, I mean, many books, uh, they or many authors, they they face this dilemma. They they want to 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 teach physical chemistry with no math, and then in many books you find that they try to replace the derivative by delta p delta x. There is no simplification in this. It looks simple, but it's actually more, more way more complicated. Because there's the, the so-called delta calculus is actually more complicated than the differential it's, it's calculus because you cannot take the limit when things yeah. go to zero. The infinitesimal calculus, that's that's yeah, yeah. that's the, which is why it's so simple. So this is actually not simpler. But because it doesn't involve a derivative or an integral, then students believe it is simple. But this is an illusion. Great. And this is starting point now when you, uh, the nice thing about this too is once you've learned some of this, it often keeps students from having to memorize as many equations because they can just take a fundamental starting point and kind of work through a lot of it. And I think the other thing uh, that's, that's really critical about using calculus, differential equations, et cetera, is a lot of times you're able to put these in very visual terms. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of really visualize the math, which is what you've done here, where you really show this exponential type decay of you know, the concentration, uh, of, in this case, the reactants. You know. Yeah, and you see down here, this is the, now we had the differential law, so this is called the integrated reaction law. So now this is the integrated form to be compared to what we had before, which was dA dt equal to minus k times a. So this is the differential form of the rate law. This is the integrated form. And now you see when you want to plot this, then 
this is what you are plotting here, the ratio of A divided by A naught. Yeah. What we typically call normalized. Right, you want to normalize. normalize it to whatever the starting concentration was as right. being one. And, not, and then now that it's normalized, then everything, no matter what your initial concentration was, Exactly. Will scale That's this way. why they all start from one, yeah. because you are normalizing it. And then the, the, the slope the, of, of this different curve depends on the value of k. And then you see immediately that if you increase k, the decay rate is faster right. for larger k. So this is what is, you see here, increasing k. And then you see, you see here a graphical representation of exactly the same mathematical information we had before. So as Jeff was saying, there's no need to memorize anything. Right. I, can, I can do this in the back of an envelope. Well, and the nice mm -hmm. thing about taking it to this level is, while you could have done the same with the general variables in, in you know, the general variables X and Y, this gives it a way of being very concrete because, you know, this is taking what we think of as, you know, real concentrations of whatever you want it to be. You know, you can pick a reaction and actually think about this in real chemical terms, in real physical terms. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that really helps students sometimes with the math. Um, you know, and the other thing I think, uh, as you've shown here, is there's a lot of different ways to visualize this. And it's very, very common to want to linearize um, anything, right? Because uh, linear equations are often just easier to fit, easier to uh, graph and look at, et cetera. And so on the left, uh, you've shown something that is very easy to do in almost any plotting package or spreadsheet package, et cetera, which is um, to do it in a logarithmic uh, way. Um, again, this connection is so beautifully simple. You have the integrated law, this is the one here, and then you take the, the natural log on, on both sides of this equation. So here you have the log of A equal to now the log of a product is the sum of the logs, so the log of A naught minus KT. So you see immediately that, that taking the log, when you plot the log versus T, then you have the straight line. The equation of the straight line is Y of X. We go back to our Y of X is A plus BX, where A is the intercept and, and B is the, the slope. slope. Yeah. So immediately you see that there's nothing, there's nothing to memorize. Right. So in reality, if I, if I ask you, okay, so what would it look like a plot of the concentration, of the log of the concentration versus time for first of the reaction? You just take a piece of paper and work it out in, in 10 seconds. Right. And no mistakes. Well, and it's also sometimes so critical. It's amazing some of the little points, like you said, like, you know, uh, you've written your straight line here and sometimes you'll, some people, you'll just see it like M X plus B is a very common way. You see it sometimes written, et cetera. And, you know, so that students never get stumbled on just little nomenclature and little what I would call differences in just how, you know, the variables used or the symbolism used, et cetera. If you, if you kind of work through the math yourself, then usually if you see something like this, you immediately know, it's not like you have any, oh, okay, so, you know, instead of M, they're using B, and instead of B, they're using A here, et cetera. But it's only when, you know, students really haven't kind of worked through some of the algebra and math themselves right. and plotted it, that they'll sometimes just be so linear in how they look at these you know, equations, and they're just trying to find the one that fits instead of just understanding, oh, this has the right, you know, uh, form that I'm looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And it's only when you understand the concept of a function that you get x and then the value f of x that you can go to the abstract level and realize that this is exactly, I give you the value of c and you take f of z. So when you understand that x and z corresponds to the same mathematical object, that is the domain of the function, and f, or it's the range of the function, that, we are, that you realize that you're just only using different symbols, but yeah. the concept or is exactly the same. same. Yeah. And, and this is the, the you, you wouldn't believe how important this is. I mean, in many cases, this is the key to the bridge that we were talking about before, between concepts that live in, several, in different parts of your memory, your brain, and they are disconnected. They are like islands. You don't know how to go right. from one to the other. Now, once you have these kind of bridges, you say, oh, so now I know how to go from chemistry to math and, and backwards. 
Oh. Yeah, exactly. Now you're showing, in a sense, what I would say is kind of the next looking at something that uh, uh, is a little more um, complicated or the next level in, in looking at this ordinary first order differential equation if it's not homogeneous. Right, right. and then again, we, we, we do it step by step. So we take now this Q of X is not zero. So this is the equation we have, Y prime plus PY equal to Q. Now it turns out, that you can convince ourselves that the, the most general solution to this type of differential equations is a sum of the homogeneous equations and a particular equation, a particular solution. So now we know how to find the homogeneous solution. We just, yeah, this corresponds to Q yeah. equal to zero. We just did that. Yes. So we know that. So now it comes to think, how do we find a particular solution to this differential equation? And then it turns out, okay, you might think of this as a trick. But there's no trick here. This is a fundamental property of uh, differentials, of, of derivative. That if you take the, the derivative of a product, you, you have the product is y, uh, u times y, so you get u times, uh, times uh, y prime plus u. So, so what is it here? So this is the fundamental difference of uh, the fundamental definition of the product of a uh, of a product, the, the, the derivative of product two functions. Now, if you can find a factor e of x, which is called an integrating factor, such that when you multiply the differential equation, you get a form that looks exactly like this, it turns out that you can find a particular solution. So it, it's not trick. It's, it's, it's a beautiful application of one of the fundamental properties of derivative. That is that the derivative of a product is the derivative of one times the other plus the other, the first right. times the derivative of the other. Yeah. So, and that gets you so many times, including not only in ordinary differential, but partial derivatives, et cetera, all the time. Right. Um, and then once, so, so, so this so-called integrating factor is defined in such a way that when you form the product, which is equal to, now you have to multiply the whole equation by u, so it's, u times x prime plus u p x y. So if this is true, then you immediately find the solution just by integration because, I mean, this is, it would be the simplest definition of integration. So now the only thing that is missing is, I, with this I have actually shown that if I can find a u factor that does this, then this is a solution. This is what I have shown here. And now it comes to the next question. Can I find the integrating factor? And this is the second part here. Right. So, and, and then it turns out that to find the integrating factor is very simple. You just start simplifying this equation until you get to u prime equal to u times p. And then this you can solve because p you know. So again, this is the, like the integration, the homogeneous solution. And then you can actually find u is here. And if you can find u, then you can find the solution. So this is two steps. First step, you show that if you can find a u, an integrating factor that does this for you, you can solve for you, for, uh, you can find y of x. And next step, you actually find the integrating factor. And this way, now you can solve any first order differential equation, doesn't matter right. which one. It's homogeneous or not. And so, and you've shown one here that's very classic in um, kinetics where uh, it's not just a reactant going to a product, but it goes through an intermediate uh, state. And therefore you have two different uh, rate laws that define this, right? What it goes to the intermediate and then the rate from the intermediate to the product. Right, and, and we write the three rate equations, one for A, a disappears with a rate constant of k sub a. Then the intermediate Idiot. is, oops. Yeah, yeah, you have right here, you, yeah. you have how the uh, reactants are changing, and then you know how the intermediates change with time and the products change right. with time. Right, so the, the intermediate is created this way and destroyed that way. So you have a positive sign and a negative sign. And, and this is why, because the, 
when you, this we know how to integrate. This is homogeneous. We, are, right. we, we already, we did, already that. did that. Yeah. So when you replace that here, then you realize that the equation for the intermediate is not homogeneous. Because you have, remember, y prime plus p times y equal to q. So now this yes. is q and it's not zero. So you need the full machinery. And when you use the full machinery, it's not very complicated. You can actually get the equations for A, you already did that. And assuming that initially there was only A, present, not, yeah. present. Oh, mistake, present. Uh, so then you can actually integrate everything and get A, get I, and get P. Right. And then I think also, you know, graphing this shows very, while you still have this, uh, you know, exponential decay here, you can see how, you know, this intermediate changes. And, and now we can look at that very graphically as well in a normalized fashion. And of course, it's, you know, looking at the top equation, it's starting at zero, but how it changes as a function of time is more complicated because it's not just how it is being created from A, but also how it's dissipating or being used up in creating Right, and, and again, the beauty of this is that, let's say that somebody measured this in a lab and he comes up with his plot. And he asks you, so this maximum here, how are we to understand this? And then you immediately look at your, your, your equation for the intermediate, and you realize that the equation for the intermediate actually shows exactly that behavior that it goes through a maximum. So yeah. you can actually find exactly the location what? of the maximum demanding di, dt, or oh, sorry, equal to zero. Because at that position, the derivative, which is the slope of, of, the, of the tangent, it is, you are going to give a zero, zero. slope. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually, you know, if somebody did this experimentally, and you understand these equations, immediately you can put together the experimental results and a mechanism. And you can, add, because this is, for this sim very simple case, this is the mechanism of this reaction. So now you put together the reaction, the mechanism, and how each individual concentration for the reactant, the intermediate, and the product behaves as a function of time. So you have everything. Right. So with that, uh, you know, this in a sense to me motivates uh, or hopefully will motivate students to that there's some real, uh, by understanding ordinary differential, first order differential equations, both in a homogeneous case and in an inhomogeneous case, can directly relate to how reaction, how mole in molecular sciences, how chemical reactions change with time or their kinetics. Um, what are some of your a favorite, if, if somebody wants to, you know, delve a little more into ordinary differential equations, do you have any specific references that you think are are, are really good for students? Well, uh, yeah, they, I mean, there, there are either websites, I mean, what, what I would suggest is that if you find a book on differential equation, let's say, for instance, Boyce and the Prima, it's an old book, but it's a fantastic book. But also, if you can see them play with with a you know with a program like a Mathematica. Yeah, exactly. And it, so Mathematica is a symbolic, it's a symbolic, symbolic language. And but it, it's really nice because it does let you not only see it but then immediately plot and visualize these. Exactly. Things. So it tells you. I mean, with Mathematica, you can ask the question: What is the derivative of a function with respect to a certain variable? The derivative, and then it will give you it will give you an answer. And then right. you can immediately ask in the next line, plot this. And then you see the derivative on the plot. But now the it is extremely rewarding if you go to do this and you know in advance what the program is going to do. Right, right. So you can well, actually and look understand at it, and say, it but, it, but it can go both ways. A lot of times you can sit in Mathematica and have it solve it. And then once you get the answer, you know, try to back out reasoning exactly. why. And so right. I think it often does go both ways. And I'll add a couple more here like, uh, SciMath is a, a completely online that'll do some symbolic. Um, sometimes if uh, uh, it's a Canadian one that's similar to Mathematica, Maple, um, it's fairly good. And then the other one I like to just generally say is um, 
you know, Python because they have what's called matplotlib and numlib right. and, and stuff like that. I, and what I think of as an IPython uh, kind of notebook interface that allows you to symbolically look at things. But just that, it, you know, a lot of students always thought, oh, I have to have a memorization of derivative tables or integral tables and blah, blah, blah. You know, a lot of times it's much more important that not that you memorize all these things, but you really start to understand how to use them, what derivatives are used for on real applied problems in science. Right, and we are talking about the chemical reaction, but we can also be talking about bacteria or how populations be, be, be have a larger we, economy. How, well, it's simple as anytime something is changing right. as a function, you can use derivatives yeah. to try to express that change. So, you know, anytime you're looking at evolu evolution or, or the change of anything, calculus comes to bear on these problems. Right, and the other connection that you probably want to understand is that if you have a function, the domain goes into f of x, that is the range of the function. You can also represent this as a table, x, f of x, and then you give value here, so x naught, f of x naught, xn, yes. f of xn. Now, the whole table contains in principle the same information as the function. If you have a full table, of course, now you realize that having a table with a finite number of values is not the same as having the symbolic representation of the function. But very often, we don't have the symbolic representation of the function. Well, we have the table. Now we play with the table as if it were the function. Right. And so calculus can be extended to playing with tables. And then the only additional thing you need is statistics in addition to calculus, because now you have to, to make certain that you have enough information here to draw a conclusion because you don't have the full function. Right. So when you put all these things together, you have an enormously powerful thing which is not to be afraid of. It's actually a very nice companion. Well, and all the programs you just uh, talked about, you know, you can do this firsthand because you can do numerical integrations versus true, you know, so, so digital programs almost always allow you to do different types of discrete numerical type integrations, uh, et cetera, to look at these things. And, and I think it's really, you know, what drives it home a lot for students is not just looking at the math, but immediately applying it to things of interest, things that are tangentially important to what you're trying to figure right, out. Right, and this is exactly what we're trying to do with moms. Yeah, well, thanks for moms today, Vladdy. Uh, and we'll be back hopefully again soon talking about, uh, you know, moms in a different area of science. Exactly. Thanks. Thank you.